Okay, welcome and thank you all for attending uh, Trail Talks tonight. I'm Ahmad Mirza, I'm the librarian here with the Santa Barbara Public Library. Uh, before we begin, and I know some of you heard this earlier, but I just want a big, a big shout out and thank you to James Wapitich, who's uh, our library partner for these uh, Trail Talk series. Uh, another, once again, big thank you to James helping us uh, coordinating these events with us. And if you're interested in following James' adventures, you can follow his blog, www.songsofthewilderness.com. Um, and you get the updates there and also sign up for the newsletter to see kind of what's happening in our area um, in terms of hikes or workshops or classes like that. James does some, some really cool things. Uh, definitely check it out. Um, if you want to register for the next Trail Talks, that's on the library calendar now. Not all everybody can do it at once, but you can if you want to. Uh, that's going to be Thursday, January 20th. Um, and that one is titled Medicinal Herbs of California uh, with Lanny Kaufner. So mark your calendar, uh, 5.30, January 20th. That's a Thursday. Um, before I introduce the speaker this evening, I wanted to say that if anyone has any questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat. Uh, if we have time at the end of the presentation, um, we will try to get to your questions, um, which we might have some time today. So think of questions, get them out there. This is your opportunity to ask. Um, and um, if you missed the presentation or catch portions of it or want to share it, we're going to be having the uh, presentation on YouTube, on the library's YouTube site. And everyone who registered, that's why it's important to register, even if you don't can't make the live session, to register, we will send the link to you uh, with the YouTube link so that you can watch it or share it and, and send it out there. Okay, shifting gears here now. I uh, do want to introduce our speaker this evening and the talk. Um, Give us a little introduction here. From, from wide beaches to lush forests to windswept bluffs and dramatic sea stacks, the stunning coast of Oregon is emerging as the next great long distance hiking experience. Author Bonnie Henderson is an expert of the Oregon Coast Trail and has just written the first guidebook for through hikers. Learn the ins and outs of, of hiking this trail, including when to go, where to camp, and how to deal with bay mouths. Is that correct, Bonnie? <laughs> Am I saying that one right? And gaps, yeah. okay, good. And gaps in the trail and why this hike is her favorite. Uh, Bonnie is an avid hiker and the author of Hiking the Oregon Coast Trail and two other Oregon hiking guidebooks from Mountaineers Books, as well as two nonfiction books, if you're interested, check them out, uh, Oregon State University Press, The Next Tsunami, Living on a Restless Coast and Strand, an Odyssey of Pacific Ocean Debris. Um, there's more info on this. And I also want to plug Bonnie's websites here. Um, if you want to follow uh, Bonnie's adventures or writings, uh, bonniehendersonwrites.com. And the other one was hiking the oct, O C T, hikingtheoct.com. Thank you, Bonnie, so much for joining us today. We're really excited. Welcome. Welcome to Santa Barbara virtually. <laughs> Thank you, Ahmad. Uh, greetings from Eugene, Oregon. <laughs> and um, hey, thanks, James, for tracking me down and the library for having me. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk to people about this trail that I love. Um, I think there will be time for questions afterwards I'm, uh, because I know people will have some if you're thinking about hiking this trail. Um, let me see. I'm going to start by sharing my screen here. So. Uh, Basically, the Oregon Coast Trail is a roughly 400 mile continuous hiking route from the Columbia River um, up north to the California border. And it's been around and hikeable for more than 30 years, but really only recently has it been sort of discovered by the long distance hiking community. Um, <clears throat> and I suspect it's gonna get even more use now that this guidebook of mine is, is out. Um, which sort of demystifies and explains a lot of the uh, intricacies of hiking this trail. Um, I'm gonna start with a little background, which I think will help you understand the ways in which this trail is similar to and maybe different from other uh, long distance trails you might've hiked. So, uh, okay, this is not advancing. That's kind of weird. Okay, 
now we're advancing. All right, I'm gonna start with this guy. Um, this is Oregon Governor Oswald West, a uh, couple of years after he took office in 1911. He took a horseback ride on his saddle horse, whose name was Fred the Freak, uh, down the northern coast of Oregon from Cannon Beach up over Neoconee Mountain and down to the Nahalem River. And apparently, according to a note he wrote to a friend of his, he had a kind of epiphany on this on this ride. And two years later, he talked the legislature in Oregon into declaring all of the state's beaches public highways, um, which totally made sense because uh, they pretty much had the beaches had been the most uh, convenient way to go north and south on the Oregon coast ever since humans arrived uh, in Oregon, really, and still were in 1911 and would continue to be until the coast highway was built in the in maybe the 30s. Um, most of Oregon's coast is sandy beaches, 262 miles out of, uh, uh, I think, about 360. So um, it was the most convenient way and, and uh, it still is a great way to travel on the Oregon coast. And 50 years after that legislation, there was another bill passed by the Oregon legislature, the Oregon Beach Bill, which actually extended that uh, public access on the beaches all the way up to the vegetation line and also ensured that there would continue to be beach access points for the public. So that's really kind of the basis of the uh, Oregon Coast Trail. Um, in 1929, Oregon State Parks, which barely existed at that point, uh, started to expand uh, in part by buying up a lot of the headlands along the Oregon coast between the beaches. Um, for example, this one, Cape Sebastian uh, on the south coast. And uh, most of them had been logged. Uh, so they were bare naked headlands uh, and were very cheap. And uh, so that way the state was able to acquire all this great public land between the beaches. And um, the depression was on then and along came the Civilian Conservation Corps which built a lot of trails over those headlands. Uh, so then uh, fast forward a little bit to the 1980s. Um, actually in 1950, this guy on the right, uh, whose name was Sam Dickin, he was a U of O geography professor who had this idea of knitting together those sandy beaches with those existing trails and maybe building some more connecting trails. And it wouldn't be too hard to have a continuous hiking route all along the Oregon coast. Um, it took a while for that uh, uh, the state to get some funding and some planning around that, but by the late 80s, there was uh, an Oregon Coast Trail that was sort of declared hikeable, I think, in 1988. Um, this is a little ceremony to, to mark the more or less completion of the northernmost section. Um, but then, as now, it was not entirely done. There are still sections of the trail where you have to walk on road, sometimes even on the highway shoulder. Um, and frankly, if you've been researching the Oregon Coast Trail online, you may have read uh, that most of the Oregon Coast Trail is on the highway or that half of the Oregon Coast Trail is on the highway. It's not, no one would hike it if it was, but uh, there is some highway hiking and it is part of the experience at this point. Um, my real purpose in writing this guidebook was to keep people off the highway as much as they can, uh, as much as possible. I think people who post things like most of the trail is on the highway are people who didn't have good maps, didn't have good guidance, didn't hike the whole trail, um, and uh, didn't realize that where they could get back off the highway and onto the beach. So that really was kind of my purpose in writing this book. I will talk more about that highway walking business in a minute. Um, what the Oregon Coast Trail really is, uh, is half of it is a beach walk. Literally half of the Oregon Coast Trail is just walking on the beach, not even above the beach, just on, on the sandy beach. Um, even more if you get bay boat rides across a few bay mouths and don't have to hike around the bay, which I strongly recommend. And I'll talk more about that in a second too. Um, it's also about a quarter trail hiking. This is on Tillamook Head. Um, so the Oregon Coast Trail starts off with 16 miles of walking down the beach 
and then about a half mile along the highway to get over a uh, river, and then on a trail back on the beach, and then on a trail over Tillamook Head, where you see these massive Sitka spruce, and it's a, it's a gorgeous hike. Um, and there's just one headland after another uh, down the coast that's similar to this. And there is also some hiking on quiet back roads. This is on the south coast on what's called the Old Coast Road. Um, and there are still some places where you have to hike along the highway to get across a river um, or to get around a steep section of cliffs and where there's no public uh, land where it's private land and no place to, to build an off trail highway off highway trail. Um, so we'll I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, just about myself, I've been hiking on the coast and writing about it for decades. I did my first uh, solo through hike in 2008 and 2009. Um, actually, I did it in two halves, those two summers, uh, because I was still working full time and couldn't quite figure out how to get a whole month off at once. Um, I went back into the whole thing in 2019, and it was while I was hiking that with uh, a few friends that I got an email from the Mountaineers Books uh, approving my proposal to write this guidebook, which made the rest of the trip even more fun. Um, I have also I've been a backpacker all my life. I've backpacked most of the Pacific Crest Trail through Oregon. Um, I've hiked end to end on several trails in the UK and in France, um, which helped me think about how to hike end to end on the Oregon Coast Trail and what kinds of, of uh, sort of infrastructure changes would help make that a better experience. Uh, so all of that has informed my uh, expertise about the Oregon Coast Trail. Uh, what I love about the Oregon Coast Trail, well, first of all, just the fact that you're half the time just walking on the beach, which is itself awesome. Uh, the weather is usually great in the summer. If you do a through hike, which takes at least three or four weeks, you will get rained on, uh, but you probably will not have much rain. Um, it, the weather tends to be pretty good here in the summer. If you hike it north to south, which I strongly recommend, um, that constant Oregon coast breeze will be at your back and be kind of kind of nice. Um, it's an incredibly scenic trail, as you can imagine, if you've ever been to the Oregon coast. This is from the top of Neokani Mountain on the north coast. Uh, I think I've got a little pointer here I can show. So from here, you hike down to this beach, walk along the beach, get a little ferry right across the mouth of this uh, river. And then you're just hiking on down the coast. And uh, unlike on a lot of trails in the mountains, it's really cool to be able to get these long views and see where you've come from and where you're headed. Uh, yeah, the scenery is just great. And even though it's all the coast, it's incredibly varied. It's changing all the time. Uh, <laughs> one Pacific Crest Trail hiker uh, that I met and who hiked the Oregon Coast Trail calls it the Cap Cap coffee Camino, uh, because she was stopping every day to get uh, lattes. I mean, there's lots of places where you can stop and get a latte, get a get a uh, beer, get some great fish and chips. It's kind of one of the fun things about the Oregon Coast Trail, actually. Um, and one thing I love, I think this guy's head is a little, might be cut off, maybe not, um, is uh, these boat mouth, um, bay mouth ferries. There are three places where it's very easy to get a ride across a bay um, from a boaters. A couple of them you have to prearrange. Um, on my first hike down the Oregon Coast Trail, I didn't prearrange anything and I mostly hitched rides with recreational boaters who were out and about and waved them over and just got them to, to uh, take me across the other side of the river. Uh, that's a really fun part of the, of the trip and to me a, a, a special part of it. Um, and I will say another thing I really like about the Oregon Coast Trail, and I know this is the same in California as it is in Oregon, the, the backcountry has gotten really, really crowded and trailhead access points are insane. This is one of the most crowded spots. Um, this picture was taken before the pandemic um, at Short Sand Beach on the North Coast, a very popular surfing beach and just beach for families. The parking areas for it are insane and unsafe at this point. There are so many people um, getting out and uh, things are crowded. And when you're just hiking down the Oregon coast, you don't have to worry about parking. 
you're staying out of the most crowded places. Uh, you're not really going through any towns. You're going alongside towns, which you can stop in at, but uh, you're just out on the beach and enjoying it in kind of the least uh, impactful way, a very uh, po positive way, I, I think. Um, so I, it's one of the things I, I love about it. It's a way to have a very low impact uh, on the outdoors. Um, the Oregon Coast Trail is definitely not a wilderness, as you've gathered. Um, you are hiking past towns, not every day, but most days. You will be camping in some developed campsites, um, some or most of the time. You know, in that way and in other ways, it's very different from, for example, a Pacific Crest Trail hike in uh, the forest. But it, it may not be a wilderness, but it is most definitely an adventure. Um, you will be wading lots of creeks and rivers, and you need to stay aware of the tide because you're gonna have to cross some of them uh, at low tide. This is across the mouth of Sand Lake where the water, I've crossed it twice and both times the water came up to my waist before I got across to the other side. Um, the tide is also a factor in getting around several headlands, so you do have to be watching the tide and be careful about that. Um, you will probably have days when you don't see another person. There are some very remote stretches. Um, you need to be prepared to hike around 15 miles a day. Uh, you can obviously, someone coming off the Pacific Crest Trail, which has happened sometimes because of high snow in the Sierra, or wildfires in Oregon, people have peeled off the Pacific Crest Trail and come over to the Oregon Coast Trail. And if you're used to hiking 25 miles a day, that's great. You can do it here too. You don't have to though. Um, but it is hard to do it much shorter than that just because there aren't that many campsites and places to stay. So you, you do have to be prepared to hike some fairly long days. Um, <clears throat> there's gonna be places where you're scrambling over big piles of boulders, or you might hit a place where uh, a, there's been a landslide and the trail has kind of slid away and you gotta figure out how to crawl around that, or there's some windfall in trees that you have to crawl through or get over somehow. Um, and the uh, wayfinding can be, um, a little bit challenging in places, it's not too bad. Uh, my guidebook helps with that, I think, um, but sometimes you gotta do some looking to figure out how to get where you wanna be. Um, and you might end up doing some stealth camping, uh, by which I mean basically camping illegally or you're not supposed to because uh, you haven't been able to get where you intended to go. There's just not a close enough campsite that you can get to. I am not urging anybody to break the law, but uh, that may be a part of your hike um, just because it needs to be. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, if you are already a seasoned backpacker, there are some things that are kind of unique or at least different uh, from most other trails you've hiked um, about the Oregon Coast Trail. So I wanna talk about those. First of all, um, Overnighting on the Oregon Coast Trail. I think a lot of people picture it to be just a series of camping on the beach every night. Not really what happens. Um, the, the real backbone of uh, camping on the Oregon Coast Trail is what are called hiker biker campsites. And this is one uh, at South Beach State Park near the town of Newport. Every state park on the Oregon coast has what's called a hiker biker campsite. That is a place, it's like a big group camp area where uh, you do not need to make a reservation. In fact, you can't make a reservation, it's drop-in only. It can only be used by people who arrive under their own power. So typically it is uh, cyclists cycling down, cycling down 101 or increasingly Oregon coast trail hikers. Um, it costs uh, seven to $9 a night. Um, and that includes showers and a place to set up your tent and some shared picnic tables and some shared fire pits. Uh, they're actually really fun. I mean, it's not like finding your own campsite in the wilderness, but it's kind of fun to meet other people who are like you doing the same kind of thing. And uh, it's very convenient. It's kind of glamping in a way. Um, so there's the hiker biker campsites. 
And then there are also uh, a few private, more than a few um, private campgrounds on the Oregon Coast Trail that allow tent camping. Basically, there are RV parks that have carved out a spot for tent campers, and some are not very attractive, and some are really nice. This is one on the South Coast called Honey Bear by the Sea. Uh, when you arrive, you walk in off the highway, and there's just a big RV campground, and then you walk down this little road that you see in the background, and here's this huge field with five campsites for tent hikers. Um, it's really, really nice camping. Uh, again, kind of glamping because they've got a shower and that kind of thing. So you might use a uh, other private developed campsites. And in there are a few places where you can do dispersed camping as you do in any national forest. This is in the Oregon Dunes. It's called Oregon Dunes National Recreation Area. And it's adjacent to about 40 miles of uh, a beach of Oregon Coast Trail on the Central Coast, and you can kind of camp anywhere in the dunes. So there's a, there's, there are some places where you can do dispersed camping, like you might be accustomed to. Um, and then there's beach camping. Uh, this is my sad tent after a night uh, of rain and lightning on the South Coast. Um, I'm not a big fan of beach camping. It's very sandy. Sand gets into everything, and especially if it gets wet. Um, but you can. I, there are people who mostly beach camp on the Oregon Coast Trail, and I think they end up camping. They don't know any better, and so they've probably camped in places where it's not allowed. You are allowed to camp on the beach in Oregon with three exceptions. One is in uh, snowy plover protected zones. There is a protected shorebird called the Western Snowy Plover. And um, you can hike, it, it camps right on the open sand. So in these places where they're trying to encourage the birds to nest, uh, you're not allowed to camp. And they're well marked and well known, but they do limit your camping opportunities, especially on the central coast. The other place is adjacent to any state park. Whether there's a campground there or not, state parks does not allow you to camp next to a state park on the beach. And most cities have ordinances not allowing people to camp adjacent to their city. So, uh, and there are some where that there's really not much uh, enforcement of that. And there are other towns such as Cannon Beach where the police drive on the beach at night and will kick you off. So you do need to be aware of that. Um, in between, there are places where you can camp on the beach. I've noticed some of them in my guidebook, um, but that's it's just one, one of the part of the mix of, of camping on the Oregon Coast Trail. And then this is my friend Mike stealth camping on a trail. Uh, I think it just got late and he needed a place to sleep and this is where he set up his tent. Um, the, the good thing is, and in a place, in a, probably in a state park, I don't know exactly where he is, but it's obviously not, not a developed campground, probably not really strictly legal. Um, most or Oregon Coast Trail hikers tend to have a good reputation at this point. Um, they know how to leave no trace, which is really the key. Don't set up a tent until it's dark. Um, be re really careful about uh, where you take a crap and, and bury uh, your waste appropriately. Um, you obviously should not set out on a, on a trip like this without knowing the basic principles of leave no trace. And um, I hope that you will continue if you do this trail to, to give us a good reputation and be careful about um, having a really minimal impact. Um, so let's see. Oh, and then there's end to end, which is also really fun. I, one hike I did, it was sort of a, we did a combination, swung back and forth between inns and uh, camping. And that was a fun thing to do because it allowed us to kind of keep it at a, right around that 15 miles a day. Um, you will find uh, that lodging, obviously lodging an end to end hike is much more expensive than backpacking, even with the expensive campgrounds. Um, it's much cheaper on the Oregon coast than on the California coast, um, and it varies widely, but uh, again, it is a lot cheaper. This is a room at a really cool place called the Drift Inn in the town of Yahats on the central coast. I think this room is about $160 a night. This same place has uh, a series of rooms 
that are small and have shared a uh, bathroom down the hall that are $50 a night. There's a hostel on the Oregon, on the Northern Oregon coast, just one. Um, and again, it just really varies. Uh, there are places where you can still find a, a motel at around $100 a night with an ocean view. So uh, you just need to uh, pick, pick, do a little research, but you can definitely hike in to in, especially if you're willing to hike some longer days. Water. I want to talk about water on the Oregon Coast Trail. Um, backpackers tend to get their water out of creeks, and obviously that is a fine thing to do in the mountains when you're drinking out of uh, sort of headwater streams. But it is completely different on the Oregon Coast Trail. You, if you were to drink uh, water out of creeks, you are drinking water at the very end of its journey before it hits the ocean. And uh, it's, I would not touch it. Um, and I would urge you to stick to tap water. Um, when you look up into the, the the mountains backing the beach and you see these beautiful forests. Those are probably industrial timberlands where they have sprayed pesticides and herbicides. Um, there's a lot of agricultural land fronting the coast, dairy farms in Tillamook County where again, um, all kinds of uh, things have gone into the water from those farms. There's highway runoff and then there's just the ordinary uh, worries about Giardia and you can't filter all of that out. So I would urge people to not get water out of surface streams, even filtering it. Fortunately, there are many, many sources of water on the Oregon Coast Trail. There's, there are very few days when you um, don't have at least one place where you can get tap water um, and don't have to carry it more than a day. There are a few places like on the central coast that, where it's more remote uh, in the dunes. And there's kind of a long stretch on the south coast, about 30 miles where there's no water. Um, but most places it's very easy to get tap water, which is uh, what I would urge people to do. Toilets are also a thing on the Oregon Coast Trail. There are even more toilets than there are sources of water. Um, and I would urge you to use toilets everywhere you can. Um, this may look like a wild dune, but it's actually kind of somebody's front yard. Uh, and again, you, you don't, uh, Feces do not break down in sand the way they do in soil. Um, and it's, uh, you're often in fairly civilized places where people are maybe digging sand castles or whatever. Um, you might not have any privacy and it's just not a good place to be um, taking a crap, frankly. So uh, watch for toilets. Uh, another thing I put in my guidebook, all the maps have every toilet location I can think of uh, that I know of on the Oregon coast. So along the trail. So um, you definitely want to be thinking that way. That's a very different way to think about uh, hiking than in a, on a wilderness trip, for example. And then food resupply. You do not have to mail packages ahead to yourself on this trip, uh, on this trail. There are lots of grocery stores. Um, you really don't need to go more than three days anywhere. Uh, without hitting a grocery store, uh, I would say. Um, also lots of places where you can just stop and get a meal right along uh, the trail. This is in the town of Waldport on the central coast. So um, food's pretty easy. It's pretty easy, especially if you're not picky and you're willing to resupply from grocery stores. Uh, that's pretty easy to do. Wayfinding is, can be challenging a little bit. There are these little, um, blue and white and black signs that show you where to go. Uh, they're not everywhere you need them. Sometimes they're a little bit inaccurate. For example, this spot points you from the beach to go inland on this trail, which is a fine thing if you wanna use the restroom here in the park, but actually the Oregon Coast Trail at this point continues down the beach. So um, wayfinding can be a little bit challenging. Uh, that's one of the things I've really tried to tackle in my book to make it easier for people to uh, stay on the trail and stay on the beach. Um, in addition to these uh, little blue and white and black signs, there are these big neon yellow beach emergency access signs, and they're awesome. These were just put up in the past, well, since about 2015, and 
they're all along the coast. Um, they, the numbers do not correspond to mileage. They're just numbered signs. And the purpose of them is to uh, is for emergency beach access. So they're near every beach access point. If something bad happens, somebody's out in the water and having trouble and you need to call uh, for emergency uh, help, you can tell emergency responders where you are on near side, sign 60, for example. They also happen to be great uh, wayfinding tools for the Oregon Coast Trail. So again, I put those numbers in the maps in my book. Um, you may not see that little, little blue and white sign from as you're hiking down the beach, but you will see that neon yellow sign and you'll, you'll know where maybe this is a spot where you need to get off the beach, get onto a trail or get on the highway for a mile and then get back to the, to the beach. So there, these two signage regimens are helpful for wayfinding. Uh, I thought I'd talk a minute about costs. Um, you know, when you're doing a big hike on most trails like the Pacific Crest Trail, let's say all your expense is gonna be for the, for the most part up front, getting your gear, um, buying your food, sending it ahead to yourself. Um, it's different on the Oregon Coast Trail and you'll probably spend a little more money. Um, as I mentioned, the hiker biker camps cost seven to $9. Uh, you uh, might get some boat shuttles, you um, might get a motel room here and there. It, it kind of all adds up. Um, I figure, and you might get a cab or, or a bus ride here and there if you don't want to, if you want to skip ahead and skip a highway walking stretch or something. Um, I would say figure about $200 uh, just for hiker biker campsites and a few other developed campsites. Um, another hundred dollars if you're getting boat shuttles. So that's just uh, something to think about. It's not a ton of money, but it's different from most backpacking trips. And then I just want to urge people if they're thinking about hiking the Oregon Coast Trail, definitely hike north to south. Um, it's almost always windy at the coast uh, and it's almost always from the north to northwest if uh, in the summer. So if you're hiking south, that's no problem. Uh, and there are many days where uh, it's 12 to 15 miles an hour. It's pretty good wind. Not always, but many days. And so if you're hiking south, it's just pleasant. If you're hiking north, it's just a hassle. You're just hiking into uh, wind every day. And I don't know why anybody would want to do that if they know. So I really want to urge people to go north to south. Um, so. Now I want to talk a minute about this highway walking business. Um, most of it, it, first of all, if you do get rides across the major bay mouths where boat shuttles are available, and if you have a good guidebook um, showing you how to stay on the trail, then only about 10% of your hike will be on the shoulder of the highway, which sounds like a lot. But um, the thing is, most of it is in very short stretches, um, just like in this photo. So this hiker has hiked down a long stretch of beach. She's gotten <coughs> to the north jetty of the Yaquina River in Newport, followed a little trail up to this park, walked out the road uh, to the highway, got on the bridge crossing the Yaquina River. At the end of the bridge, she took some stairs down, walked out the south jetty of the river, and she's back on the trail. That's the kind of thing that you're, that most of the highway walking is kind of like that, very short stretches uh, in between over a river or in between the beach sections. Um, you might have a little more highway walking if you're not able to catch the tide right and you get stuck on one side of a headland or uh, for example, this is Hug Point on the North Coast. There's kind of a cool trail uh, blasted out of the rock here, um, which takes you around that headland, but it's only accessible for about an hour either side of low tide. So you want to be watching the tide and you can uh, further cut down on your highway walking. Otherwise, you have to walk about a mile along the highway to get on the other side of this headland. Um, again, those boat shuttles, uh, it's 17 miles around Tillamook Bay on the highway shoulder or you can stop and get a boat ride across the mouth of the bay and get right back on the beach and continue on down uh, the beach. So uh, I urge people to 
think about using boat shuttles because it's very much worth it. To me, that's that's sort of the essence of, of the Oregon Coast Trail is staying on off the highway as much as you can. Um, but that does still leave some long highway stretches. This is the longest one, uh, it's 10 miles roughly, I think from Humbug's Mountain State Park on the South Coast back until you can get back on the beach. Um, I, I included this photo because uh, I took it while I was hiking that stretch early one morning. It actually is not a bad hike. There's not a lot of traffic on the south coast of Oregon. You start out early uh, from the state park at Humbug Mountain. Um, it was a lovely day, uh, beautiful scenery still along the highway. And I ran into these two characters uh, who were cycling down the coast, uh, including the guy in pink lycra who was hauling a trailer made out of his surfboard. And I stopped and chatted with him. Um, so it was another part of the adventure. Uh, and frankly, by the time you get to that 10 mile stretch, uh, you've already hiked, I don't know, more than 300 miles. So it's hiking 10 miles. is not that big a deal. Um, but that there is that long stretch, no doubt about it. Um, so what does this mean to you if you're planning a trip on the Oregon Coast Trail? Well, uh, first of all, if you're planning a section hike, avoid the sections that have long highway stretches. Uh, the very, the, the first 70 miles or so of the Oregon Coast Trail, south of the Columbia River, there is only a half mile of walking on the highway. That's a great place to go. Um, go down to the Oregon, the Central Coast in the Oregon Dunes. Um, uh, there, there's actually a lot of stretches where there's no hiking at all along the highway or very little. So just plan uh, carefully. This is a photo at the end of Three Mile Lake in the Oregon Dunes. Really nice, long, remote stretch of hiking, which would be great for a few days of backpacking and you would not be on the highway at all. Um, and then if you're doing a through hike, it's not that bad. This is uh, from that early morning hike I took uh, along the highway south of Humbug Mountain State Park. It was pretty, it was, it was not bad. Um, very little traffic, it's lovely. So just suck it up um, and hike it. Uh, on the other hand, there is bus service and cab service. Um, there's bus service all along the coast and there's cabs in, in most places. In most places you have cell service. Um, uh, the bus down here on the south coast, if you call them ahead, they will stop right at the entrance to the Humbug Mountain State Park and they will drive you to where you wanna get off at where the trail returns to the beach. So you don't have to hike on the highway. There are alternatives. Um, I thought I would end by uh, sharing some comments that Oregon Coast Trail finishers made in 2019. There's sort of a, an official end of the Oregon Coast Trail at what's called Chrissy Field State Recreation Site on the far south coast, right at the California border. Um, and in 2019, for the first time, they put out a roster and started getting uh, or asking for names of Oregon Coast Trail finishers uh, just to try to get a sense of how many people were hiking it and where they were from and what kind of feedback they had about the trail. Um, <clears throat> so here is a sample of their comments. Gorgeous, gratitude, love OCT, amazing. I love her comment, amazing. Best thing I've ever done for myself, Love the hiker biker campgrounds. Love the towns and breweries. Incredible, scenery was spectacular. Uh, but they also said things like, need better signage, need more camping, need to construct more trails sections to get off the highway. Add signs on the highway for hikers on road, which I thought was a great idea. And they've actually already started doing that at least in one spot. And people wanted uh, Oregon Coast Trail branded stickers and other merch, which uh, really barely exists, but maybe will start to uh, appear soon, I hope. Um, <clears throat> like I mentioned earlier, people have been through hiking the Oregon Coast Trail for maybe 30, maybe 30 or 40 years at the most. 
but in very small numbers. Um, really, you didn't start to see a lot of hikers on the Oregon Coast Trail until about 2017. Um, when use really jumped and it's it stayed high except during the pandemic where it was kind of shut down for a year and then minimal last year. Um, it's clearly just going to grow and I think that'll happen partly because of my guidebook being out now and, and it being uh, having some guidance about better maps and information about where to go. Um, uh, and I mean, frankly, as wildfires become more problematic on the Pacific Crest Trail, um, that's probably going to drive people to the Oregon Coast Trail too. And as just word gets out about it. Um, the first time I hiked the Oregon Coast Trail back in 2008 and 2009, I did not meet another through hiker. And in 2019, uh, we, I met dozens of through hikers and half of them were from overseas, um, New Zealand, Ireland, Germany, Australia, the Netherlands. I mean, words getting out. Um, and I expect 10 years from now that there will be Oregon Coast Trail t-shirts and stickers and other merch, and uh, maybe even a lug luggage transfer service that allows people to uh, hike in the inn and not have to carry all their stuff. Um, which you can do on other world-class long distance trails. Um, and maybe, uh, I haven't really talked about this, but there is an ongoing effort to reduce that highway walking and uh, find alternatives such as building more trail, well, mainly building more trail um, and improving boat shuttle ferry access. Um, in the meanwhile, honestly, it's still, I would call it amazing. It's a great trail. And, um, I think I will see, yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen. My book is also available in Kindle, although I, I talked the publishers into keeping it a small format book. So it's only 12 ounces, but if you're really ultra light uh, like me, you don't even want that extra 12 ounces. So you can get it on Kindle if you uh, want to use it while you're hiking. Um, I will stop sharing my screen and um, I would love to hear any questions and help answer, and answer them as I can. Sweet. Wolfert, that was an incredible presentation. I'm looking at my calendar now. It's like, when can I go up? <laughs> I love the wide, like that shot. Like, it's, yeah, we, we, you know, hilly, but you could see, like, I just did all that. <laughs> it's really a nice feeling. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it truly, that is one of the great things about it. I love that. So um, we got a few questions here. Or we could get cracking on these. Um, so we got one question is, I'm interested in, in taking a scout troop on section hike from Fort Stevens to Cannon Beach for approximately 30 miles, five days. What are your thoughts or any other recommendations? Ah, my recommendation is that you email me through my website <laughs> because uh, it's kind of a tough trail to do with kids because the distances tend to be pretty long between uh, legal campsites, frankly. But there are some things you can do and uh, it's probably more complicated and, and, and you can do that um, stretch. But uh, seriously, shoot me an email through bonniehendersonwrites.com and I'm happy to give you um, some tips. Okay, sweet. <laughs> No, that works. I mean, yeah. it might seem like a very detailed answer, possibly some rerouting there. Um, we have given the different terrains and water um, and a couple questions about this as well as uh, footwear wise. Any recommendation? Oh. Yeah, um, I tend to backpack in trail runners. Um, I've also <clears throat> so I've done the, the OCT and trail runners. I've also done it in lightweight waterproof hiking boots. Um, honestly, I kind of prefer the hiking boots, uh, the waterproof, um, because there are lots of places where you have to cross little tiny creeks, slightly bigger creeks, rivers, and there are a lot of them that are just the size where you can just splash through them, and you can do that in trail runners, but, it, you know, it's nice to keep your feet dry, and uh, don't have to take off your shoot your boots as often, so that's what I like, but trail runners work fine uh, also. Sweet. I'm just gonna just kind of just throw all these questions at you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I know this was mentioned earlier about the dispersed camping, but uh, does Oregon allow dispersed camping 
or does it have to be developed campsites? And you went over that. So is you, there is dispersed camping? In yeah, Oregon. let me let me just reiterate that where you there's it's not Oregon. It's more that the National Forest allows dispersed camping and uh, the National Forest administers Oregon Dunes National Recreation Area in the middle of the Oregon Coast Trail. So there's about 40 miles or so where you can dispersed camp. Um, there was a question about uh, hikers with small inflatable boats. Is that like something would be recommended to pack or, or? I would I would definitely not do that. I know people, I've heard people talk about doing that. They're really heavy. Even if they're small, they're heavy. And you're, you're carrying a lot of weight for a very short thing. Um, I, I wouldn't bother with it. I really wouldn't. Okay. That's, that's your answer that with that one. Um, a question, yeah, thumbs down. <laughs> thumbs down, unless you're out there without an inflatable boat and you need it. No, uh, where is uh, yeah, where is the hostel on the North Coast? Oh, that's that's in the town of Seaside, Seaside International Hostel. It's it's at a perfect spot too because it's um, in the middle of a long stretch with no campgrounds. Um, let me just jump in with another thing I saw earlier um, that flashed on the screen, a question about, uh, because I realized I didn't cover this and I should, and it's very important. Someone asked about the season, the best season to hike. Um, the best weather is from, best weather is in June through September. You could go earlier in the spring, you'd just be a little more likely to get rain. Um, the real limiting factor is river levels. On the north coast, it's not that big a deal because anywhere there's a big river, there's also a big bridge. On the south coast, there are a number of rivers that you cannot cross in the winter. They're just too high um, and there's no nearby bridge. You'd have to ba bash through a bunch of private property to get to the highway to find a bridge to cross. Um, those rivers are just too high, even at low tide, to cross in the winter. So all, all the rivers on the coast reach their summer levels by mid-June. So that's why I really consider June to the end of September, um, the hiking season on the Oregon Coast Trail. What happens in October is at, at some point, either early in the month or late in the month, the big southwester storms start. And you don't want to be on a headland when uh, trees are falling down in those. So that's that's the season. Yes, and you want to try to go from north to south. <laughs> yeah, so you can you can you can start earlier because you know it takes you a couple of weeks to get down to the place where the rivers are, uh, where you have to be able to wade those rivers. So um, there were a couple questions that uh, a few people have asked about the boat shuttles, about um, prearranging them or logistics, um, typical wait times for them. Just sure. Me, yeah. Sure. So the three that are that are really easy to do, and all these details are in my book. But there's one that is so easy. They're they're open all day. You can almost wave them down, or just get on your cell phone, and they'll come right out over and pick you up. No prearranging. Um, then there are two that like to be notified 24 to 48 hours in advance. One of them, um, they really only operate at high tide, and it needs to be an incoming tide, I think. And the other one, um, they don't care about the tide, but they are mainly a, a fishing outfitting service. And so you kind of have to work around their schedule. So um, yeah, those, those kind of require some, but in both those places, I will say the first time I hiked the OCT, I just went down to the docks and <clears throat> well, one was docks and, and uh, asking a guy if he could give me a ride. And then the other one was just on the beach, waited for a boat to go by and waved guy over so so that's an option too and okay and then um we have a question uh kind of i guess we could do this as a two-parter but uh any wild animal issues that you you would that people should be aware of and then the second part to that i guess would be uh there was a question about uh dogs allowed um would it you know dog yeah, friendly yeah. trail hikes yeah yeah two good questions um first the animals the animals to really fear are the rodents and birds that are going to get into your food if you don't pay attention, especially at developed campgrounds. Um, that's just a fact. Uh, they've learned that backpacks have food in them. Um, one of the things that's cool about the hiker biker camps, 
I think all of them now, or maybe almost all of them, also now have little these little kind of kiosk things with lockers. And if you carry a little lightweight padlock, you can even lock your stuff up. But at the very least, you can shove your food in there and uh, close it. And it's a nice way to keep your food. Um, you don't even have to hang your food. You can just shove it in there. And they also have uh, um, phone charging stations. So it's wow. kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, so that's those are the animals to be to fear. And um, <laughs> just for, not for your own personal <laughs> life, but uh, your food. Um, there are black bears on the coast. Um, I have seen them. They've only run away from me. Um, there are cougars. No one's ever been killed by a cougar on the Oregon coast in recorded history. So I would, I don't worry about them at all. You, there are elk and you definitely want to keep your distance from elk um, just because that's a smart thing to do. Uh, but you'll be lucky to see them. That would be kind of cool. Um, so those are those are sort of the animal issues. Um, I have seen a tick, <laughs> but only once. Uh, so uh, that's all I have to say about, I guess, wild animals. animals. Um, the other question about dogs. Dogs, I, I love my dog. She's right here. Um, oh. But I do not recommend uh, hiking the Oregon Coast Trail with a dog, mainly because it really reduces... Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one is it reduces your flexibility. Let's say you get to a point where you really don't want to walk around that bay and uh, you think, I'll just take a bus. You can't take a bus if you have a dog. Um, also, the snowy plover zones where you cannot camp, but you can walk, they don't allow dogs at all, not even on leash um, from <clears throat> during the nesting season from March 15th to September 15th. So. Um, and you, you may well get busted for that. I've, I've always seen um, the biologists that are in, in charge of those areas. They're, they're often out and they're, they're looking for that. They, they do not want dogs out there then. So, you know, if you're going to hike with your dog, um, you can section hike in places where there's no snowy plover zones, nesting areas. And, uh, or you could start off on the first of early September, hike down the North Coast where there's not any snowy plover nesting or not much, uh, maybe start September 7th or 8th or something. And then by the time you get to the other, the snowy plover areas, the, the restriction is off by the middle of September. So that's, hopefully that's helpful about dogs. No, that's very helpful. It's good, good very good information to know. Um, there were some questions, uh, multiple people have asked about uh, pack weights and also the um, uh, a little bit information about the type of equipment um, that would be helpful. Um, I, a little bit, of, you talked a little bit about shoes, but um, anything else that you recommend? Um, <clears throat> well, it's, it's pretty much, you know, just backpacking basics, but uh, <clears throat> A few things that uh, kind of come to mind. One is it doesn't really get much colder at night than about 50 degrees. So you do not need a real heavy sleeping bag. Um, tents, I'm a big ultralight backpacker. I, my stuff is very, very light. I know it's expensive, um, but it, it so makes it worth so much more worthwhile. Um, the first time I did it, uh, I actually borrowed a, a tarp from a friend, a particular kind of tarp that, you know, in, in lieu of a tent, um, just because I like really lightweight. I realized that was kind of a dumb thing because I forgot about camping and hiker biker camps, which are developed and there's people around and you kind of need some privacy. <laughs> uh, so you do want a tent. Um, let me see what else to say about that. You know, uh, some long distance hikers uh, don't use stoves. And if you want to save some pack weight, that's, you could certainly do that on the Oregon Coast Trail. I would miss my morning tea personally, but uh, there are so many places to stop and, and get, a, get a meal if you want to go, um, you know, cook. This, this is a trail you could do that on. Um, I, I can't really, I don't really have a number for pack weight, but you can keep your pack very, very light. You've got to have rain gear, obviously. Um, if you're willing to rinse out your, you know, your socks and underpants or whatever, um, every day or two, you can just really keep your pack weight really low. 
you can even stop and take a layer every day and do laundry. There's plenty of those laundromats along the way if you want to do that. Um, and then uh, again, you don't have to carry food for too many days. And you you will want to, I, I carried a couple of extra lead, liter pop bottles, just empty, um, to use in those couple of stretches where there was no water, tap water for a couple of days. Um, yeah, that kind of gives you some ideas about things you need, you know, particular to the trail. Uh, I got a couple more here. Uh, there's a question on um, where are the planned sections of building more trail? Um, <clears throat> there's a thing underway right now called the Oregon Coast Trail Action Plan, and that is exactly what they are working on figuring out. Um, Right now, they're identifying all the gap, what they call the gaps, all the places where basically they're talking about highway hiking stretches, and where that can, where they can build trail. And uh, there, you know, every every year or two, there's another stretch added. There's one. There was one just added in the last couple of years. Um, between Cannon Beach, between Arch Cape and uh, Manzanita on the North Coast. Um, th there are a number of opportunity areas, but there's many challenges along the way. And, and one of them is uh, building new trail in uh, areas where there may, may be cultural artifacts um, from native people. You know, you could have public land and a, and a great place to build a trail, but if you're digging, even signage, um, you don't wanna be digging into uh, middens or things like that. So there, there are just many different challenges and I, I can't really say one specific spot. There's just lots of spots all the way along where they're looking at it. Um, do you might know more about this question. Uh, are there any plans to lobby far out, formerly uh, Gut Hook to develop an app for the OCT? You know, I don't. I'm not real uh, hooked into that. I, I talked to somebody who was going to be doing doing that for Gut Hook specifically uh, a few several years ago. I don't think that came about or maybe part of the trail is on Gut Hook. I'm not sure. Um, so uh, I have no, I'm not really clued into the status of apps like that. Um, I am sure that in the next couple of years, you will see them because the trail use is going up so much. Um, thanks for that. There was a, that was a neat question that just came in. Um, I've done a lot of end-to-end -end hiking in Europe. Uh, what section lends itself to this style, just using the day pack? And also there was a part, the second part was about, a, what about baggage service? Okay, that is that is the problem. Um, right now, I'm I'm working with several friends. I've done that too, and we're we're working on setting up a end to end hike uh, on England's southwest coast this summer. The thing is, there's no luggage transfer service yet on the Oregon Coast Trail. If there's somebody out there who would like to do that, it's a great business opportunity. Please, you've got an automatic audience. There's so many people <laughs> who would like this. Um, I think it'd be great. I should do it myself, but there is no luggage transfer service right now. You could probably figure it out by, you know, paying a cab, but it'd be awkward. Um, and as far as the best, I, I mentioned some, uh, I'm just going to sell my book. I mean, I, I, I have some itineraries in the book um, that you could do end to end. Um, Yeah, there's, there's um, honestly in the North Coast, you can't really do it on the, on the South Coast unless you're going to hike some really long distances. On the North Coast, where there are a lot more tourist towns, um, that's going to be where you're going to want to go, maybe kind of North Central around Newport, Waldport, um, Lincoln City. So, uh, yeah, check out the book. It's got some ideas. Yes. And we're going to plug the book one. Uh, it's Hiking the Oregon Coast Trail as Bonnie Henderson. And um, I know we were go to about 6.30 here. So I, want, I just wanna respect your time, Bonnie. Um, I, I'm fine, I wanna respect yours, but I'm happy to answer a few more questions. 
Yeah, let's see if, if any other questions you, you have a chance to put it in the chat. I, I did see there was one on, there was a horse question. Are horses allowed or do you see any horses? Um, um, I've never seen anybody doing a through hike on horses. I don't think you could do that because I don't think horses are allowed on those state parks trails over the headlands. But a lot of people, I mean, there is some some riding on the beaches in Oregon. There was a question here about the bus. Is there a bus service that can take you back from the south end to the north end, or is there any? Yeah, there there kind of is. You can do it, but okay. uh, the, the only problem with bus service on the Oregon coast is um, it's it's a patchwork of services. So there's Curry County Transport on the south end, and then there's uh, on the north end, it's Sunset Empire. Uh, so there, there's like five different uh, um, bus systems. Um, yeah, so you can do that, but it's it takes a while <laughs> to get to get all the way back by bus. Um, there is a question that just came in, also on how safe is it uh, for single women? You know, that's. A, um, I'll tell you right now, when I first, first time I did it, I hiked it by myself in my fifties and, uh, I had so many people ask me, is that say, is that safe? Is, you know, is that safe? And I'm like, would you ask a man that, you know, no, yes, it's, it's safe and it's not safe. Nothing is totally safe. Um, I, this, <laughs> this kind of, I obviously have a little fire around this question. Um, <laughs> yes, it's safe. Yeah, you should not go backpacking unless you know what you're doing, especially if you go by yourself. But I've had a great time. I had a great time doing it by myself. I've known a bunch of other women who've do it, done it by themselves. What, there's this really cool woman I just met in the, in the last month named uh, Patty Matiskela, and she has a blog called um, outdoorpilgrim.com. Check it. She hikes all over the place by herself, and she did the Oregon Coast Trail last summer. She's, it's really fun to read her blog, so uh, check it out. Um, the, the one thing I will say is people ha are afraid of different things. Um, some people are afraid of getting eaten by wild animals. Some people are afraid of getting raped or murdered by bad people. Um, some people are afraid of falling off cliffs. Um, my own fear ha in the outdoors is hurting, falling down, hurting myself, and nobody is going to find me. And that's not a problem on most of the Oregon Coast Trail because there's usually people around. Um, I, it, you know, it's not a safe activity, um, but you know, because you have to be on your own and 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 watch you know, take care of yourself. But I think it's a very safe thing to do personally for women to do or anybody to do by yourself. I know many women have done it and uh, I think it's a great trail for women to do by themselves, in my own opinion. Thank you, Bonnie. I was gonna throw out there that the wet socks thing got me. I'm like, I don't know. That's just it's wet That's socks it. in the water. And I'm like, <laughs> what yeah. did that turn into? <laughs> Stub my foot, now it's an infection. Like that's where my brain goes when I see water in a yeah. hike, and I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> Everybody's got different things, yeah. exactly. I'm just, yeah. uh, no one makes fun of me. I remember watching everybody here; they were going to throw, mail me wet socks or something. No, <laughs> like, but um, as far as I see here, um, there was a question on the on tent stakes for uh, sand, long tent stakes. Is that for the camping, uh, pitching tent, I guess, on the on the, the beach? Yeah, I'm trying to think of what I did. Um, I think I used driftwood to anchor my tent. Um, yeah, because I, I, you know, I have a very small, lightweight tent. Uh, that tent you saw in the photo, and that's what I would have used is just driftwood where I needed to anchor it. Perfect. Because yeah, tent tent stakes would be hard. Perfect. Um, yeah, I don't know if somebody had a follow-up question about that safety thing. I, I do want to say you you definitely have to be aware of where you are. There are places where I wouldn't camp because I 
it was too close to the highway for my comfort. I didn't want to be that close to people. Um, and, uh, but I mean, it's one of the nice things is those hiker biker camps. You're always with people like you. And so it, you, you do have to be aware of your surroundings, but in general, it's, um, I, I think a fairly safe activity. Hey, one other thing I want to mention about my book, um, there's also a book called Exploring the Oregon Coast Trail uh, by a different uh, author, Connie Soper. I think it's a really cool book. She wrote it as um, a way to hike the Oregon Coast Trail as a series of day hikes. So I think especially if people are living in Oregon, it's a, it's a great way to do it. You can hike the whole trail over several years um, just as one day hike after another. Um, but it doesn't include details that you need as a backpacker, like where to camp, where to get water, how to cross the bay mouths, that kind of thing. So that's um, if that's what you want to do, be looking for hiking the Oregon Coast Trail, not exploring the Oregon Coast Trail. Perfect. And I think we're going to wrap up at this point to 630. We're going to get you, get you all. We said 630, so we're going to go. Uh, thank you for everyone who's attended. We I think we had over 100 people, uh, participants at, at, at one point. Um, Bonnie, that was a great presentation. I'm sure a lot of people um, in the community have the, are marked their calendars for a oct trip here soon. Um, also want to just put in again um your book um it's the hiking the oregon coast trail um the guidebook that uh that you've written um as well as your websites uh to plug those in one more time um bonniehendersonwrites.com and hiking the oct oct.com and I'm, I'm gonna put those in the chat as well uh for everyone to see uh we really appreciate your time bonnie that is an incredible presentation Hey, thanks so much, Ahmad, and, and thanks uh, for everybody who came. I, I love talking about this trail, and uh, yeah, it's great. Uh, if you do have if you, if you do have questions that um, aren't really answered in the book, really, I'm fine with getting emails. So. Yeah, check the website in the contact. You can send Bonnie an email. Uh, more specific questions, like the one earlier about specific um, itinerary uh, for the trip there, um, and then let's want shout out again for the next uh trail talks it's going to be in january 20th uh thursday january 20th and that one is uh titled medicinal herbs of california with lanny Kaufner. and uh, that one you can register on uh the library's uh calendar it's up right now uh perfect thank you bonnie so much thank you it's for really your time. Fun. thank you so hopefully we could have you back soon <laughs> thank you so much Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Have a good rest of your night.